Okay, so calling this meeting of the Greenfield Planning Board to order, it is 6.01, and uh, this meeting is being recorded, and if any other persons uh, present, uh, in person or virtually, uh, notify the chairperson uh, if you are doing that. Um, and I don't know what time, I assume Allison was planning to get here on the early side. Why don't we, rather than introducing ourselves, because there's some new faces, why don't we do the minutes first, and then we can introduce ourselves both to her and to anyone watching. So, is there a um, motion to approve the minutes of May 2nd? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Any <clears throat> suggested changes? Hearing seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Four zero. And uh, the next item is the uh, first the discussion of the proposed amendments to the Open Space Cluster Development Ordinance. Um, the people have had, I'm sure, a chance to look over what had been. Um, the previous iteration of the board uh, proposal. And that had, boy, I can't tell you exactly when, when this process started with Allison. We had a number of meetings uh, with her and um, uh, <clears throat> brought some other examples of other communities. And uh, um, we went through various possibilities, you know, um, incentives. And, you know, there were a range of incentives other communities had had. And we, um, pick some that we thought were more relevant to uh, Greenfield. Um, so I'm sorry that that we're, you folks, it's coming in you know later into the process. Um, were you here, Sarah, for any of that? Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. So thought. Um, and I know it's a a relatively complex um, proposal uh, portion of the uh, ordinance. I unfortunately don't have um, Allison's contact info, so. To um, send her email that she's. Thank you. If um, if Allison's not able to join us, would we want to uh, continue this discussion? If she's not able to join us at all. That was a question. Yeah. No, I would. Yeah. I would defer to the rest of the board. I don't feel the need of it as much, but I would think it would be good for the board to have a chance to interact with her. I'm, I'm assuming she'll be late. Can you tell me who she is or what? Yes, yes sir. Um, she's a per cog um, uh, consultant, um, and I don't know her exact title. Senior Land Use and Natural Resources Planner. Thank you. A number that's in her email signature is an office extension. Hmm. And she's prepared this or she had consulted with us over as i say a course of a number of months and we had a few sessions with her and uh so we had made the the um in the proposed amendments uh the planning board members previous planning board members had made the choice of the changes okay. based on consultation with her and she was going to give kind of a refresher background information for everybody Got it. Okay. Are you able to email that email address just to, um, sorry to have to lean on you so much with this. No, it's fine. Does that door lock at six? It unlocks it. It, 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 it locked at five, then it unlocks at 545. So we were standing, a couple of us were standing out there when it remains happened. unlocked and stays at like nine, I think so. Three hours past. Okay. Yeah. It's not like it locks exactly when the meeting starts or something. No. Uh, I'm sorry. No, it would be an interesting uh, open meeting wall. <laughs> so did folks get the email from Eric that Eric forwarded from Allison? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Because um, Allison had forwarded us all of the like relevant documentation of the process, kind of, okay. uh, which I found pretty helpful. It looks like uh, it started back in 2022. Um, so... And I don't know if yeah, everyone's had a chance because it came late. It just, right. Yeah. They, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to look at it. Um, I skimmed through it. I haven't. Yeah. That's why I especially wanted her to be able to. And if we have to, if we have to defer this, that's seems more important. 
there's not a timeliness factor. We right. could have done this. Remember, we were talking about the beginning of this calendar year. We could have done this, but right. Eric's. We all agreed with Eric's uh, suggestion to hold off yeah. with the simpler ones. Oh, oh, here's Allison. Uh, hey there. I think you're muted. I am. I'm so sorry. I'm late. No, no, just a little bit. Good to see you. Um, and uh, um, I hope you're feeling okay. I know you were uncertain if what you had was or were experiencing was contagious. So I couldn't tell if it was allergies or not. I sound a lot better than I did this morning. So, but I don't want to get any of you sick anyway. Yep. And I'm glad we have the hybrid option now. So we can do it this way. So uh, we're going to do introductions. We hadn't done that yet because I know there's some new faces here from when you started this uh, uh, this process. Uh, so Allison, you know, I'm George Columpsis, and I'm the planning board uh, chair at this point. So that oh, changed too, right? Now. Well, cool. yeah. <laughs> so why don't we go around for introductions, if you would please. Uh, Peter McIver and nice Jeff Souser. Uh, Jeff Souser, your vice chair. Nice to meet you. And I'm Sarah Brown Hansen. I'm a planning board member. Great. Nice and we you. have a couple other, we have another member and a, a alternate, Amy, who, uh, Amy Mann was part of this process, but uh, neither one yep. is here at the moment. I'm not sure if they're going to be joining us. So, um, okay. and the materials you had sent that Eric forwarded, uh, we did receive, but only received them today. So just so you have, so yeah. not everyone's had a chance to look through them. So, um, but it's interesting when this process goes over a long time, we have so much turnover that, you know, people are picking up, you know, late in the process of earlier planning board members, you know, decision making process. So um, yeah. it'd be great to have you give kind of a overview and for, you know, planning board members to ask any questions they have or make any comments. So take it away. Okay. Um, sorry, my charger on my work computer died right as I was trying to sign in. So I'm trying to get the packet I sent so I can share it and go through it. Um, hold on. Okay, so do you want me to just start back in June 2022? Is that okay? That's and I preferable. can I what? That is preferable. Yes. The, okay. From the from the beginning. <laughs> okay. From I know I, I have to remind myself too because we started this so long ago, which is it will be interesting to hear new thoughts. But so back in June, well, I'll start from the very beginning. So the FERCOG has a grant from the Department of Environmental Protection to do a watershed scale zoning project. So we're working with the towns of, of um, Shelburne and Bernardston as well to update some of their zoning ordinances to improve um, stormwater management um, with an eye towards hopefully improving water quality with understanding that what they do upstream could impact Greenfield and what Greenfield does could impact other communities downstream of you. Um, so we were thinking when we started the process, we would look at Greenfield's open space cluster development ordinance and also try and do a river corridor overlay district. That was a little too ambitious. So we we're sticking to just the um, open space cluster development ordinance. Um, so back in June, I gave a presentation to the board um, summarizing what the purpose of an open space cluster development is or an OSCD. Um, which and just is clarify, I'm sorry, Allison, that was June of 22, you talked about. Yes, yes. Yes, thank well, you. Well, two years ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we uh, just went over what that is, what that means, why it's why it's beneficial to communities. And um, the short answer is that it can help optimize the protection of open space, um, which would be great to do in Greenfield. There are a couple of areas that could be subdivided. So if we have an appealing um, open space cluster development ordinance, hopefully a developer would choose to um, develop under those guidelines. So this is an example um, that shows what would happen to a parcel of land under a traditional subdivision where you have all the houses laid out and it's somewhat of a sprawling development versus um, uh, cluster development where everything is pretty uh, 
built on smaller lots and you have more protected open space. Um, so when I looked at Greenfield's ordinance, um, I found that there were a couple of suggestions that we could look at and consider incorporating into, into your ordinance. And um, that was first to up the amount of required protection in the rural residential zoning district. The current ordinance only requires that 25% of the space is protected. Um, whereas Mass Audubon's guidelines say that that should, that should be closer to 50%. Um, so we considered that. Then we also considered doing a um, density bonus so that you can try and make the cluster development ordinance more appealing. Um, if if developers do certain things, then they can uh, build more lots than would be traditionally allowed. Um, so we discussed a couple of examples. Um, we also discussed adding pollinator friendly language. Um, and yeah, then this was talking about trying to, if we wanted to do the overlay, the river corridor overlay district at the same time, then try and incorporate that. But we're going to scratch that because we're probably hopefully going to work on that later. Um, so then based on that conversation with the board, the board at the time was most interested in doing a density bonus or devising a density bonus system. So I wrote up a memo, which I'm not going to go through this in too much detail right now, but providing examples from other communities that have um, locally that have also that also have a density bonus system in their cluster development ordinance or zoning bylaw. Um, so I gave examples from Sunderland, um, Shelburne, and Deerfield. Um, and then based on, did you have a question? Oh. No, no, I was saying hello to um, our other member who just joined. Okay. Um, yeah, so then based on the examples that we saw um, from those towns, um, oh, this was also in the memo. I'll pause here. So this was a part of the memo and it might be interesting for y'all to take a closer look at, but the point of this map was to show the areas in the city that could be subdivided based on the size of um, the parcel or, or really where we wanna think about, okay, where could this ordinance actually be used? So the, the light purple parcels are undeveloped five, five plus acres and the yellow is the sewer and the dark blue is the water lines. Um, so that'll just give you an idea of where maybe this, this could happen in the city. Um, and then notes about how I constructed that map are also included in that. Um, and then that takes us to the zoning ordinance. So I put together um, I went back through it and I highlighted everything that we changed. So when you look at it, anything in yellow is what is language that was updated or added. Um, and then to remind myself of what we did, I, I made comments um, noting, noting all the changes um, and tried to provide the reasoning. Um, so I can, does it make more, sense to go through this comment by comment and, and talk about the specific changes? Do you have questions on how we got here? I'll just pause. Thank you, Allison. And and President, if you could introduce yourself both with the recording and Allison. V Victor Michelle, my apologies for being late. No problem. Nice to meet you. And um, I'll, again, the, the board has had access to the draft uh, amendment for a while so okay. uh, i'll defer to board members uh, so feel free to say what um would be helpful at this point anyone can you clarify just the on the premise of a cluster development that by default the density stays the same or does the density drop when you cluster because you just can't get enough units because they definitely showed at the, at the beginning showed you know, half the density of the conventional subdivision. 
Right. So I guess it's all about the number of units. Um, or is that how you're using density? Yeah, I mean, my, I guess the, the basic argument is we shouldn't, if we're, if we're going to change anything about what governs density, it should be creating opportunities for more units. Right, it's right. The principle, right. Right. So yeah, that's that's why we wanted to add in the density bonus to incentivize um, that. And so the bonus brings you above the density of the conventional subdivision, not it would allow you to do more than you could do under conventional subdivision, not just more than you could do under the one on the right, which is still less than conventional. Right. Sorry, can you say that again? So if, if we were to use this as an example and you wanted to max out the density under a cluster development, mm -hmm. could you build 37 units? In a clustered format. Oh, I see. So 30, 34 versus 14. Yeah. Right. So the purpose of this is is more about conserving open space. So if you're saying your priority is more getting more units, like you would yes. prefer to have units versus conserve open space. Uh, well, I'm not convinced that you have to pick. Um, I think I would say that so if you took the middle one and just reduced all the lot sizes to 50%, you have the same number of units, but half as much disturbed land. Right. I guess what what is the math? You know, this is just an illustrative example. Right. Well, well, in the in the open space cluster development, you're allowed to have smaller lots. So, so yeah, you should be able to get more than in the conventional. Okay. With the density bonus. So wow. the lots can be fifty percent the size because you have to save fifty percent of the site. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Um, where do the numbers come from as far as the percentages that are expected to be preserved? Where, do that, where does that come from? 25, 50, 75? Where do those numbers come from? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so you mean in, in your current ordinance or just- In, in, any, in any ordinance. I, was, I, was, I went online, I did an open space plan in my town in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, doing some research back then, and then a little bit more today, just trying to understand. But in an urban, I know we're not an urban area, but 5% is considered a really good open space percentage of a development. And you're talk we're talking numbers of 25, 50, and 75% undeveloped land in a development. I'm just wondering where that number comes from. So to clear, this is just an example. This is like a classic planning example. So 75% is not on the table for Greenfield. Um, no, I wouldn't, I, I agree, but I'm just, just. Okay. Allison, just, if I could request, just because this happened before Victor arrived, there was a, a specific reference you had to, we had had in this ordinance, we have currently 25%. Mm -hmm. And the rec there was a recommendation and you gave a reference of someone who, of where that came from. Can you show that again, perhaps? Yeah, that's in it. That's in a mass Audubon report. It's best practices for um, yeah, preservation of open space, stormwater management, just to have more green space. So you're you're shrinking lot sizes and preserving more open space. Okay, the fifty percent came from there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so okay. Another, another question I have is, what is the incentive to the de to the developer to do this? So let's just use some round numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say a developer's got twenty acres. And he could put 20 lots on it for $100,000 a lot, and he can make $2 million selling his lot and developing it. What is his incentive to give up 25% of that? What does he get? Does someone buy the unused land from him at market value and he still makes his $2 million? No, the idea is that that, that land would be preserved. So, so that land would end up with a conservation restriction on it, probably handed over so to- the, So the developer is at a financial disadvantage to join this program? Not necessarily. I mean, the whole point is that they should be able to get more units. It, the lots will be smaller, but if they can build denser housing, they're selling more units. But then that hurts us as landowners. If he needs to sell his lot for $200,000 to make his two million, now you've got a $200,000 lot worth before you had a $100,000 lot. 
So how does, again, I'm just trying to understand the finances in here as well. I look, I'm all for open space. Yeah. When I look out, but when I look out my window, I see thousands of acres that will never be developed. Mm -hmm. I guess my concern is that in Greenfield, I understand we just said, I wish I'd seen it or been to the housing. We, we had a housing thing. I wish I'd seen that. Uh, we're looking for more housing in Greenfield, but yet we're putting in an ordinance that's going to restrict housing development. Um, so they seem to be counterproductive to each other. And again, if I'm thinking financially from someone who wants to develop, we want to attract the developer. How do we attract the developer to come in? And because and, I think if we can build nice communities, that may be a calling card for Greenfield. We don't have industry anymore. Mm -hmm. so what, what do we have? What can we offer? So maybe if we can uh, offer attractive communities, for because we have some towns that close by, that might be something. But how do we do that if we can't attract a developer to come in to do a development for us? Because we say, oh, look, give us half of it as green space. You don't get any money for it. You'll feel good when you go home, but you don't get anything for it. They go look at us like we're crazy. That's my opinion. So again, from what I understand, the numbers of 25, 50, and 75% are strictly arbitrary numbers. There's no basis for them. There's no study done. There's no references. It's just an arbitrary number. I can live with 25%. Hmm. But um, I just, I was just curious. So these are the kind of things that are This about. is an optional tool. Yeah, no, no, no. And look, I think it's a good idea to try and incentivize a nice community. I think open spaces are good. But when I was looking at it, again, just some more kind of odds and ends. If we can put aside five acres on a 20-acre lot, you can build like three soccer fields. You can build three football fields. You can build one baseball field. So there, there's potential for, for that. That means a neighborhood that had its own baseball field would be really kind of cool. I don't know if we need them in town. I haven't done a study to see what our field usages are and if we have enough kids to occupy them. But a neighborhood might enjoy that. I'll, I'll, I'll call on myself, uh, Allison, um, just to get some perspective, because we're talking about the comparison of mm -hmm. conventional um, development versus this. And the first example um, you gave, just to give us a, a comparative sense, um, that makes it look like that, um, you know, you're drastically reducing the number of units uh, in that example compared to the conventional. But right. but you're saying that um, the with the even with the fifty percent standard, you could have an equivalent number of units, but the units are on a smaller portion of land. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, I mean, really, you're shrinking lot sizes, so you don't have the big two acre sprawling sprawling lots. You're you're shrinking lots and putting them closer together, so that not you're not wasting right. land on large lots but i mean it's it we did this two years ago if if the board's opinion is that you would prefer to keep it in the in the rural residential to 25 percent, that is something you all are you know you can you can all revisit that um the the main recommendation from from the process two years ago was adding in the density bonus system um well it, you so I think all that, of the oh, i'm sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say i still think keeping the density bonus system would be beneficial but um, <laughs> if you if you all want to deliberate on um keeping or changing that that requirement yeah. i totally welcome that yeah i mean there had been a long process of uh former uh board um uh you know, constellation putting together this draft but this draft hasn't been initiated so it's mm -hmm. still a potential uh sure. proposal and that's why we're revisiting it because this board would have to you know forward anything to the the city council so that's why we're starting this process and helping board members get caught up and and ha be able to have this um dialogue with you um so in in answer to victor's concern about the you know the incentive to the um to the developer it's not that you're saying the number of lots could be even with 50 percent could be with this uh, sort of design could be uh, equivalent as far as number of units. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, we just, like, just what's the minimum lot size in the rural residential district? Just I was so, trying to look at it. Um, I put in, so the rural 
RC, so the minimum lot size for a single family would be 40,000 square feet. But if you build under the open space cluster, then you can knock it down to the RA. So you go from 40,000 square feet to 8,000. Yeah, okay. So you could easily, you could still double the density on half the land. Yeah. And you can do multifamily. Yes, and that was that was another thing. The The current ordinance caps multifamily at 30% of the total units. So one of our other recommendation recommendations was to scrap that cap. Um, and is that something that we did put into, is that, um, I'm, it's in there, yeah. I like the idea of crowding people into places. Just so what was that again? I like the idea of crowding people into a place just so we can save land on outside. You don't like that? No, I don't. Like, I, I I don't like having my neighbor five feet away from me or in a multifamily. If I can afford a single family, you know, it's I, I maybe it's an old American dream. I'm seventy years old. Jeff, you're working on the housing plan, right? Yes. Do you do you have any thoughts like in the context of the housing plan? I'm I so, I'm very somebody. It's a little tricky because <laughs> Jeff has to have a uh, takes off one hat. So, yeah, right, right. He has to be somewhat uh, independent of this. Oh, okay. Role. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, I can speak as a. I, mean, I am a resident, and I have okay. to be a <laughs> so, not representing the city of Greenfield or Furcon because we're working with you guys too. <laughs> uh, just as a, my own person, uh, I mean that's why I, I think that we should maximize every opportunity to to get more housing units or more density every chance we can and you know an eight thousand square foot lot i live on a lot that's less than that in town you know it's not like it's unprecedented it's just an urban format there's plenty of big lots too and the developer doesn't have to do it either if they feel the market's not there yeah. but i would say take there should be no limit to how much i mean I, I there has to be a limit i guess at some point but it, it shouldn't <laughs> be an arbitrary limit it shouldn't be I mean, referencing other districts makes sense. It's a good way to benchmark. Let's go to the densest district that we have in town and people can walk around those neighborhoods and see what they're like and, and recognize that they're not uninhabitable. So the, the multifamily is, is good too. If I guess I was trying to see what how does that work mathematically in terms of, because the you know, lot area doesn't necessarily mean the same thing for Multifamily, not you're not subdividing it where each unit is on its own lot. Mm -hmm. So what is the what, remind us what the math is if you were to go multifamily? So looking at the density table, it's it's the ten thousand square feet. So you go from fifty thousand square feet to ten thousand per unit. Per unit of the and that's across the whole site or just the fifty percent that you're building on. So, so if you're building a multifamily house in the open space cluster development in the rural residential zone, you could get, you could build that house on a 10,000 square foot lot. So, so for per building, not per unit, is that what you're saying? Per build. Per build. I'm picturing like a, an two, story up two family, two yeah. story on 10,000 square feet. Yeah. Not per residential yeah. unit, but for that building, you would have yeah. 10,000. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. What if you had a three family building? That's a good question. Um, I mean, the density table. I mean, I assume it would be the same, right? The second number is for two family dwellings, for three family and multifamily structures, there shall be the minimum requirement for two family dwellings plus an additional increase in law area for each additional unit equal to the following. Okay, so then you get a, a little bit extra. But it's 2000, uh, um, thank you for, I, I just never trust me on reading the, <laughs> I'm trying to find something quickly, you never know what you're. No, that's okay. Every just... every dimensional table is very different. So I, I haven't also... summarized our zoning yet. So what it's saying is, if so, if you did a three-family unit, you would it's twelve thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. 12, it's, there's two thousand for each additional unit. Yeah, up to some ceiling that's a lot higher than you would get if you. I mean, if it were just rural residential, you couldn't do multifamily 
at all. Could you? Rural residential. Or whatever the, the most, the, the least dense you can do our seat. I, I guess my, my concern is satisfied by, by this analysis here. Okay. Seems like you can, you can do a lot of density if you want to. Uh, still. Yeah. I, just yeah. By, getting the, by shifting the required, the, the parameters from the underlying zoning to the RA. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and Victor, to your point, I mean, this is not, this is not required at all. No, no, no. But I think it's a good idea to have things in place that promote what we're trying to accomplish. I'm not, I'm not trying to not promote it. I just want to understand all the bits and pieces of it. So when someone asks me, yep. I can answer the questions. I and mean, I can ask and put in questions myself to get more information out of it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's all. No, no. I just wanted to be clear that we're not like requiring this over a conventional. That's sure. conventional still on the table. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I think Vicky raised a, you know, both from the point of view, the, um, the desire for open space um, within, in the context of housing, uh, and also the question of um, the density of the housing, the closeness of the housing. That is, to some extent, kind of a philosophical or, or you know, uh, uh, aesthetic or, or preference kind of thing because you know, there's the more suburban kind of model of the right. Quaker lot and you know, distance from the neighbors, and then there's the more urban uh, option of a multifamily structure. Right. Um, so people living in the same building together, and um, so that's you know another. Um, consideration from a planning perspective of what are we sure. trying to? Well, I go to know. Peter said last the last meet about the Hilton Head or where we went to where they, you know, they knew what they wanted the community to look like, mm -hmm. so they had based their audiences to, to make the community look that way. So I assume that part of our responsibility is to have a vision. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I assume there are focus groups and all sorts. What do you want your community to look like? What is a community now? Like my wife grew up over on Warner Street which is an old neighborhood, you know, houses right next to each other. But that was a good thing back in the 50s and 60s. People loved that. But so nowadays, I think people are looking for a little bit more to, get, to, to sit around. And I don't know that if we're trying to attract people, we're trying to attract them into what looks like an urban environment with multifamily mm -hmm. houses everywhere. Are we trying to attract them into a neighborhood that's mixtures and things? So I think it's all part of our philosophy of the board. Yeah, That's exactly. what our community to look like. Yeah. And we push ordinances or suggestions in that direction. So that's all I'm... Well, I have two comments about that. Sure. One is, um, I think, you know, as policymakers, we need to go from the master plan, um, which is the policy document crafted by our body and, um, you know, should guide everything. Sure. So I would look to the master plan to guide our decisions. Um, and also, I think, like, uh, we can kind of let um, let the regulations and zoning allow for a variety and kind of let the market decide what people want to buy. Um, and you might be surprised about what people do want to buy. Um, it might be like that. Uh, very old, very old at all. But I don't think you need to be um, dictating people's. I, know, tastes. I, would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest dictating their, their taste. Yeah. As, as much as I would say things so that we have a flavor. What, what do we want Greenfield to look like? Yeah. Do we want Greenfield to look like yeah. downtown Baltimore? Do we want it to look like Hilton Head? Well, you know, what uh, do we want it to look like? And again, I think that's a reasonable thing. I expect is not. Yeah, again, it's not necessarily up to us as individuals with our own tastes. It's up to the... Um, Unless I mentioned focus groups. The, um, the, way to get the guiding documents that... Mm, uh, the guiding set documents the are based on people's opinions. But I just have one at a time, sorry. Just... Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't have to debate this right now, but... Um, I, that's my two cents. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it does seem like an important part of the deliberation. I mean, obviously, we're all here for the betterment of Greenfield, and we've taken on the responsibility of that. And we all have various uh, backgrounds and histories and, you know, uh, worldviews and stuff like that. And so we're trying to work together on that. Yeah. And also, like you say, reference what has come before, you know, as far as guiding, you know, documents and things like that, and how much are we you know, holding to those or weighing those and stuff like that. So um, one thing I want to, um, uh, with something uh, Victor, you said earlier about um, 
you envisioning, okay, the open space could be used for various kinds of recreational, you know, fields or something like ball fields or something like that. And I just wanted to read the um, common uh, open space requirements. And I just wanted to get some reflection on this from you, uh, Allison. It's uh, the first uh, statement, and this is, uh, was, it's currently H. Um, it would be I in the, in this uh Proposal. And then number one is all land not devoted to dwellings, accessory uses, roads, or other development shall be set aside as common land for recreation, conservation, or agricultural uses, which preserve the land in essentially its natural condition. Um, and again, just want to, you know, um, make sure we're all on the same page literally about what we're uh, working on, what we're proposing. So I want to get your sense, Allison, if, if, you know, the vision uh, Peter has of these various kind of ball fields would fit within that, uh, from your experience, would fit within that guideline? Uh, my understanding would be no, because that would be more of like a development. Um, I, I think you can do trails or something like that. That would still be preserving the open space. But yeah, developing like a ball field, I don't think that would. That was my impression. Recreation, it's its talking about a more passive kind of recreation rather than something that's altering the the, the space that. So I just wanted to be, you know, the reason just, for that was what? Just so you have trees as opposed to grass. Well, I, I think it's um, the idea of, well, let's discuss what's, what's know, the reason for that. Um, I mean, I, I think it would be maintaining um, pervious surfaces, whereas, you know, putting in a ball field, that's that's. Um, adding to impervious surfaces, which is what we don't want as a part of the voice. Doctor fields are grass. I think that it's it's conserving the natural environment, the trees, the trees, and the animals and the habitats, and that's my take on what the the, the role the goal is. Yes. Uh, uh, but but is it is the requirement that it be publicly accessible? Because you could have a conservation land that's privately owned with a fence around it. Um, I was trying to remember that too. Yeah, so so this is in the requirements um, on page five of the um, draft revision. So it can either go to... Um, what like section a, are you talking? I don't think we have page numbers here. Oh, sorry. It's, it's on... Um, if you flip to the Greenfield Proposed Zoning Ordinance Amendments draft August 2023 towards the back of the packet, where it switches to the word doc with comments, or it's up here. Um, Is this a uh, section I four? Yes. Yep. Thank I you. Four. There we go. Um, so it could be uh, to a trust that's owned by the development. Um, yeah, it can go to the owners of the lots in the development. It can go to the city. It can go to a nonprofit. That would be up to the developer. Yeah, all right. And there was actually in that, there was a uh, additional option that's in bold italic that um, the board had been proposing an additional, a fourth option, a nonprofit land trust. Yeah. Yeah. Another just technical question to make sure I understand this. The density is based on the net acreage, not the total acreage. So in certain cases where there's steep slopes or floodplains, that is deducted from the, why yeah. Why would that be in this case? If the goal is to preserve land, just that's the part you preserve. Why would you lose credit for happening? I mean, because I would suggest that we remove those deductions. You can't build on them anyway, but you should get credit for preserving them. Right. To determine net acreage. And this is under F? So. Yeah, this is under F1. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to think about this. To determine net acreage. You had 10 acres and two acres were had slopes of 25% or more. You basically have eight acres. Right. Because you deduct the two acres from your calculus. And not right. counting that essentially as open. You can't count it as open space. It doesn't exist. Yeah. You don't get to, you can't like 
what it should be is a you're basically transferring the development rights from the preserved space to the unpreserved space. But since if you happen to own land, I mean, to your point, it mean, means you can't sell that land effectively. You can't monetize it. It's going to be preserved either way because you can't build on it. Right. Um, but then you can't count. You can't under this rule, but I think you should be able to count it. Yeah. That's a good point. I'll look into that. I know um, that's the recommended way to do it. And I've only seen other communities do it that way where you're deducting mm -hmm. all that space um, and not getting credit for it. But I, I agree in, in Greenfield where you're you're looking at overall smaller parcels you would want to mm -hmm. maximize what's buildable. Um, and the, the fact that it's not developable doesn't mean it's not right. valuable open space to preserve. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if, if so. Um, another thing we added was to the subdivision regulations um, that the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board will work with the developer to do a conservation analysis and findings so that you would go out on the site and like look at what's going on there and determine where would be best to site the parcel so if we could change the language to reference you know something about getting credit for those lands that cannot be developed as I mm -hmm. think as part of mm -hmm. the conservation analysis um and we did talk about that the conservation analysis and findings process could add work um for the board and for the conservation commission but eric's thinking was there aren't this doesn't happen all the time so it's unlikely that this would be a burdensome process and it would be more beneficial did you say that again i'm sorry i didn't catch all that um eric. yeah that eric, when when we were talking about either adding the conservation analysis and findings process or not Eric's thinking was that we have Greenfield hasn't had one of these cluster developments come up in a long time. So it's unlikely that all of a sudden we would get like three or four developments where we where you would have to be doing all of these um analyses. It wouldn't be too demanding. It would be too burdensome. Yeah. And, yeah. and it would be more beneficial because you would all be working together to identify yeah. space that should be conserved yeah. and built on. I just wanted to add that because I forgot we had a we had a long conversation about it at one point. Can we go back to the question about the, the ball fields and football field. Where would that fit into this plan? In other words, if, would it have to be considered a lot? In other words, if the play the developer decided was going to put soccer fields in this development for the community, how would he account for those in his plan? Are those lots that he can that no longer sell. How does it? How would that work? You don't show anything like that on those designs. You just show the housing. Yeah, say, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, they would have to account for it in the design, but um, subdivision plans are normally just looking at housing lots, not not football mm -hmm. fields or baseball fields. The subdivisions kind of meant. You know, I think of. Um, Lyden Woods, and they have some areas set aside for playgrounds, stuff like that. Yeah. And I um, like wondered, that. you know, I mean, that's a less, you know, uh, um, less uh, use of the space. And um, but it's something that uh, could be a common thing if you're trying to attract, attract you know, families and, you know, children. Um, and has that been something you've you've seen considered in these kind of, where especially where you're trying to, Rather than, you know, a neighborhood of independent, um, uh, you know, housing kind of spread out, the more mm -hmm. suburban model, you're kind of, you know, creating a bit of a community. And uh, to have that kind of, a, uh, you know, recreational opportunity, especially for children, um, I wonder mm -hmm. if that's uh, something you've seen or has been considered in this kind of yeah, I mean, my, my understanding would be so so long as you're not exceeding the allowed density of the plan and you're keeping the amount of conserved open space required under the cluster development, then then adding a playground or or something else would be fine. I'm just um, I imagine something smaller like that would be reasonable to the de to the developer where they're not like losing a lot of housing units to a 
major field or something like that. Soccer field is like two acres. Yeah. If you're talking about a five acre lot, I don't think they're going to put a soccer it's field. 1.38, yeah, 1.38 acres for a five acre. Yeah, so so a playground would definitely, that would that would make sense and would be great yeah. in, a, in a cluster. Yeah, field. you've got to put a five, 25% of the five acre piece of land you're putting aside. So you can get soccer fields on it, but if you can't develop, quote unquote, the bad word, develop the land, what do you do? How would you put your soccer field? I think that's someone else's job to provide soccer fields in your society. I've never heard of a small development, including soccer fields, for like a small subdivision in a, a market like this. I okay. know, but you might find a small little development area that has pickleball courts. Yeah. That might attract a group of people to live there. Yeah. We've got six. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure if it's for Allison or for George, but I'm just wondering um, the the approval process for uh, open space development. Like, is this a special permit or oh. am I right? Um, um, so I believe we changed it to by right with uh, site plan review. Site plan review. Okay. Yeah. That's what's proposed to me. What's that? You're saying that's what's proposed. Yeah, and then a conventional yeah. subdivision, I think, would require a special permit. So again, trying to make this process more appealing. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Yep. So and we're I identifying at least one uh, issue um, as far as the um, not taking out issues like slope or wetlands yep. from the calculation. Uh, obviously, the um, uh, overall percentage, which is currently 25%, and which um, the this proposal bumps to 50%, that's something that's, you know, yeah. uh, you know a matter to... for the board. Huh? Yeah, that's something you all will deliberate. Yeah. But I'm just trying to think if there's anything else we would wish, uh, and I appreciate your re-involvement in this house and after you know, yeah. it's been a long time. And uh, but you know it's it's great because we're getting additional you know perspectives and thoughts on this mm -hmm. with the refreshed board. And um, I, I wonder if there are other things uh, we would wish because it sounds like we're we're leaning toward you coming back to consult with us further. Is that yeah? Is that yeah, that's say, or, that my grant runs through the end of September, so I'm okay. Able to come to the um, do you want to table this discussion for now, or do you want to look at other things that you all could think about? Well, what what I was going to suggest is since we're kind of getting to you know that one point at least was something that was uh, raised. I wonder if there's other things we'd want to flag right now that you yeah. might, uh, from your perspective, and um, you know. Uh, provide us some additional data or comparatives and stuff like that. So I yeah, just want to ask I, the board if there are other things that. Yeah, my, my quick answer is that um, if I would be coming back that I, if you all could look at section G density bonus and look mm -hmm. at the design features and the bonus criteria, this is something we spent a couple of meetings working on. Yep. Um, and it would be great to just have another set of eyes on it and think about it. Um, again, we picked the design features based on what we think would be beneficial to the city and what we've seen in other communities. And we tried to be pretty conservative with the bonuses, um, you know, not giving like 20% for something relatively basic so that we could try and incentivize a couple of those things or um yeah be be reasonable um but so so that list there it's not that can really be whatever we would like it to be so if there are things that you would yep. want to advise and and this was a list that as you were indicating earlier you gave us some examples from several different communities and yep. the planning board deliberated and made particular choices we discussed this as you were saying quite a bit and yep. came up with these but they're not they're not written in stone, they're written in italics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, that's a good prompt 
for everyone to look these over and see if they seem to make sense. Um, and it's something, you know, members would support. Um, yeah. Did anyone have any particular thoughts having these over before, or would this be um, something people would want to study on it more and, um, you know, between meetings, maybe pass along, you know, thoughts to Eric that he could pass along to Allison? You know? Is the, so what is the, uh, what is, how does this process conclude? And I guess in September, uh, when when Allison's grant is up, and sure. are we eventually going to vote to implement this or recommend this to the council to? Sure. So, what would the next step, as far as the city process, is the planning board, if it chooses to, would initiate this, and that would result in um, triggering a uh, public hearing. Um, uh, uh, there would be usually it's a joint hearing of the planning board and the economic development committee of the council. And then after that, that committee and the board would make a recommendation to the full council and the council would deliberate and vote. Okay. And I know related to that, I know Allison, Eric had um, commented to you about the possibility of uh, sitting in on the city council meeting, I believe. Does that sound yep. familiar? Yep, and, I can um, Thank you. And uh, the other thing Eric and I had a quick exchange about was that um, it, it, the, um, the joint hearing with the Economic Development Committee of the Council can be really pivotal because those subset, that subset of the City Council reports back, obviously, and, you know, how they take this in and make a recommendation can really influence because they have more of an opportunity to, you know, dig deep on it than uh, the full Council does. And I, I know I am, from my years of, of doing this, I, I totally accept when people have disagreements, you know, and, and they might say, you know, thanks for working on this, but we don't think it's a good idea. And that's the vote. What mm -hmm. has, has concerned me is that sometimes um, decisions seem to be based on lack of information, full mm -hmm. information, so they, you know, counselors don't feel confident. And they deal with a lot of stuff. I get that. So and or sometimes misinformation. And so just to maximize the, the possibility, if the this board does indeed um, decide to initiate this, to maximize their knowledge and their understanding of this, um, Eric and I were both thinking it would be great if you could attend that meeting as well. I don't yeah, need to on you, but yeah. Oh, no, that 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 would be fine. And I could definitely put together some, you know, easier to understand materials because this conversation was a great reminder it's, it's confusing <laughs> there are a lot of questions it's not straightforward um yeah. so yeah try and like make some digestible materials for everyone's on the same page so might the outcome of our meeting today be to kind of agree on it so alice are you basically your grant is to consult for us on this like we could give you homework oh yeah yeah. <laughs> so, so we could come up with ideas. We, we've started to poke at this and you've asked us next to look at the density bonus and then you could go and, and try to like interpret and, and implement or make, I guess, comments or suggestions that are your recommendation given what we said here, like this is how it might manifest and then we can look at that next time. Yeah, absolutely. As we get to the, when would that joint meeting be? Well, I imagine... I imagine we we would meet together again to, before we have like a final draft to bring. Or are you saying that that joint meeting would happen before it went to the council? Uh, so the we would vote to initiate. So that wouldn't happen till the earliest till next month because okay. obviously there are questions. So um, so then we would try to schedule that joint public hearing as soon as possible, and then it would go before full council after that hearing and the recommendations from each of these bodies okay. so i think especially thanks for reminding about the parameters of your um your role with us um moving that forward quickly would be good um okay. because it's july next month so if we could um we have, have oh, next month huh? i think we don't have a meeting next month because it's july 4th is that what eric said you know i didn't 
I didn't see that we're not having it as compared to rescheduling it. I don't know. Just um, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just no, no, that, that's that's important. But I assume we would have a meeting at some point. We okay. just tried to reschedule. Yeah. It. yeah. So, um, so that's what I'm envisioning is that okay. we try to have one more meeting on this. At which time this board will be able to make a decision if we can, you know, uh, initiate this. And so answering as many questions as possible between yep. tonight and that next one would be great and answer any concerns or questions board yep. members have. Um, so just as uh, Jeff raised the issue of um, the, um, uh, you know, the land that uh, is undevelopable and how that factors into the calculation or, you know, Victor and I were raising questions about, well, what kind of recreational stuff could you have there and how would that affect um, you know, the calculations and the, and the developers, you know, from the developer's perspective and stuff. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone had read through the, the bonuses and any of them jumped out as they all look great or really this one. Um, and if people have, we could throw those out there now. I mean, in the materials you sent today were those, uh, examples of, uh, ones that we use as a, as a guide to uh, brainstorm about this previously. Um, but uh, yeah, but if there's any other uh, things that right in the moment board members have, you could um, run by Allison for, you know, for to work on in the intervening months, that would be great. I didn't see anything strange or untoward about the bonuses. They all made sense in their own way. So. I was, I was asking myself a question, but then I see the answer to that question is on I, where the maximum density bonus is subject to the adequate space you needed for utilities. So so they may be cumulative, but they're not, you know. Unlimited. Yeah. Unlimited. Yeah. yeah. You've yeah. got 120% or something. <laughs> right. Okay, that makes sense. No, I thought I thought they were reasonable. I don't think anything wrong. Um, I have, I guess maybe a similar question or question like something that I might try to do myself is like calculate out um like let's say we have a seven acre parcel like how many units can be built on there if like 10 percent is unusable uh, and then like let's say they want one of these bonuses will that actually be make a material difference or not so in terms of like um just educating myself that's something i am going to try to do and if you were able to like yeah. get a concrete example for a future presentation yeah um, to like city council or the what is the economic development, development committee, committee of the council yeah. yeah um i think that would be helpful just to yes. make yeah. it more concrete so that people will understand because Zoning is really complicated and, you know, all these calculations and mm -hmm. it's really hard to understand what it means in yeah. reality. So. Maybe, maybe we could ask her to give her three or four hypotheticals. Like you said, a yeah. lot yeah. with 15% yeah. gone and, and two yeah, you, you don't have to do that. I, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask what we do. That's, That's what I'm asking. Yeah. 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 That can be my homework. Um, okay. okay. Excellent. Cool. Excellent. The way I would characterize it, and I think that's an excellent point, um, is when we meet next time with you, Allison, we could both look at the way you've marked up the code and also look at, I mean, we, we should start developing the presentation for that joint meeting yep. together. So yep. rather, I mean, if it works for the joint council, it's going to work for us. So like, let's, like, it, it's great for, I mean, we need that so we can fully understand this, but mm -hmm. go ahead. I, I'm assuming that our role, if we, as a body, decide we like this and we want to promote it, then we're advocates for it. Mm -hmm. So we want to make the best case we can for it. So mm -hmm. developing that case with you in parallel with finalizing the language would be important. And that's the iterative too. Mm -hmm. And and there's also I get get back to and and um thinking of Victor's point about the the overall percentage. I mean, certainly if we were to um uh adopt what Jeff was pointing out and not exclude those particular kinds of, of land that would alter the calculus basically right um because if you're saying 50 percent set aside and that includes the slopes and that 
includes the wetlands that gives a bit more room for right. development. Yes, so, right. um, so we have to think, is the 50%, which the board had earlier proposed, going from 25 to 50, does that seem like that's our consensus or is, does it feel like that's too much? I mean, obviously it's base 10 math and, you know, it is arbitrary. <laughs> it's an arbitrary number, yeah. And, yeah. and but you, you had, um, and, and do you have a, a sense of where that's trending amongst communities? Uh, I mean, obviously you gave one recommendation, mm -hmm. Audubon and stuff or? Um, In terms of how much? The percentage, the overall percentage, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to compare around here because they're mm -hmm. typically a lot higher, like Leiden's is 80%, but right. not a good, it's your neighbor, <laughs> but it's not a good comparison to Greenfield. Right. Shell right. is higher. So I'll, I think, you know, when we go to the joint meeting, I'm sure that would be a question. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and find some examples from similar communities. And, and actually, again, because we're, we're re-deliberating this, obviously, right. this is a proposal from, you know, I was the only one in the room <laughs> when, <laughs> when we uh, came to consensus on this proposal. So if you could have that for our next meeting, yeah, definitely, uh, that would be great because we have to come to agreement about what we want to, the proposal to be. And I appreciate that this is a lot of additional work for you. <laughs> no, it's fine. But it's, That's... It's, 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 it's very helpful and, and uh, really piece of the chance for board members to get caught up and, and, and uh, throw new, new ideas and new questions into the mix. So. Yeah, no, that's kind of the nature of zoning. You work on it really hard for two years, and then you drop it. And two years later, you come back, and they're like, "Okay, let's let's have some better better things in this." Um, I think the to, to inform the question of fifty percent or not. I mean, part of it is just the examples that you'll right you know, just right. stress testing some of the, the key parameters. Yeah, and comparing them always to the conventional development. So, for example, one thing you would illustrate is that under conventional development, you just can't use the land that's got the steep slopes and the the, the wetlands, but here you actually can. Right. So like Interesting. That, you're Interesting. gonna you see that and be able to quantify it through these examples. So like, in density bonuses is another one. What is a reasonable accumulation of density bonuses that one could get? Like are any of these in conflict with each other? Do they combine with each other? What would a max maxed out density bonus scenario look like? And then yeah, we can react I... to that and decide, oh that's insane. Or we'd say let's <laughs> we might say that's not enough. But it turns out you can't get too many. Let's think of some more rules so you can get more density. Yeah, well, I some, think, I think can... some communities have set a cap at, you know, you can't go over 20%. I think we deliberated on that and did not include a cap because the cap would be sewer or utilities. Yeah, utilities limit the amount of right. things you can put there. Yeah, so that, would, that was a reasonable way to stop it. You were going to yeah. say something? No, no, no. I was, gonna, I was just answering Steve's oh. point. I think the the limitation is, is, is the utility service in the number of units. You can't put 100 units if you can't put a right. sewer line in that'll serve as 100 units. And I think you know your bonus oh, says sorry. you can. I, I like the, the the phrase stress testing this, mm -hmm. and I think if Good. if these examples could be where the number of units mm -hmm. is equivalent um, for conventional or the cluster, um, because that answers Richard's concern. What's the what's the um, developers perspective why would they choose to do this you know what i'm saying so um rather than the more extreme example that's in the introduction you know of, of a lot less units um, right right so you, because that can be misleading i think you'd want to do the equivalent and then also the max yes yes so, because people, the incentive part the reason yeah. you, you might be able to you might make less money if every all else is equal except the lot sizes are smaller but if you can get smaller lots as they more units, then you can take net more profit. Right. But maybe that two-step analysis of here's conventional, here's the same number of units under the cluster, and then here's maxed out how many units can get. I, I found working with politicians to working with other types of experts, if you point to another community that did 50%, the Audubon said that, okay, great. They must know what they're talking about. But politicians have to understand it for themselves because they are yep. above the other experts. So it, it should feel intuitive to them. Mm -hmm. If it feels intuitive to them, then we're good. And to us. So yeah. we're, we're yeah, sure. This is not a, a decided thing. This, right. Yeah, it's a draft essentially. Um, 
I have one other quick Please. quick comment. I think like having the concrete examples will be really helpful because that will also answer the question that came up for us, which was uh, like, why would anyone want to do this? Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be like a big part of mm -hmm. um, of the argument if if we end up supporting this. Yep. It's such an inter this is only it's such an interesting interface of the marketplace as well as, you know, kind of us, you know, kind of envision what what we would want the community to look like or, you know, options to be within the community and stuff like that about it looks like what it looks like in functions and stuff. So it's, it's uh, yeah, interesting process. A couple of bonus thoughts. Um, first of all, it's the, ten, the, the units that can be counted towards the 10% and the units designated as affordable senior housing, are those one and the same? If you have affordable senior housing, are you also counting against the 10%? Okay, if you are, I just was curious. I'm just looking at it. Uh, affordable senior housing. So that's a good question. I think it counts. I think it could what that you could get double? But well, you get an extra fifty percent bonus. It, right. It's okay. I'm just. I just want to be. I guess I was trying to decide if you know. Can you really add up these bonuses, or are some of them combined with each other? Or if you do this one, you're not going to do that one. Uh, the the designated affordable senior. It might be nice to just have accessible universal design. Some people want a how a unit that like a senior might want a unit that is conducive to senior living but isn't like an official institutional senior right. unit. So in, instead of um affordable senior housing, just dwelling units that are universally accessible. But they could be two, you could do both. You could yeah. it, there could be an additional rule that just says if you design them as universal design, you get X bonus. Mm -hmm. yep. So an additional option yeah, yes just one more i mean they should we should have if if it doesn't matter how many we have because there's an externality that limits how much mm -hmm. density you can get then let's have as many as we could possibly think of that, that we think are important i mean they obviously have to have value but right. just knowing that one of the huge challenges we face is enough housing that seniors can live in safely and comfortably uh, there should be a strong incentive to make these accessible in that way mm -hmm. And I know that's something that um, you know, accessibility has been a big, you know, issue in town. It has been discussed a lot. Yeah, and you should, yeah. you're going to build something new, it should always be accessible and it should always yeah. be efficient. There's just no reason not. Yeah. Are we getting to the point of uh, wrapping up this item or further? I guess the last question, maybe you need to come back with it. Are there other others that you can see here that we're missing now that's been any... two years i'll i'll take another look <laughs> <laughs> i'll do my two-year review <laughs> so if we looked at this next week and had thoughts like the, we can go to eric i would send them to eric and eric will forward them but yeah. not to everybody else like what's right so it's just to eric so there's no open meeting issue but we are allowed to continue to comment as board members yes that's the, it's safest if we're not including a quorum. That's what I thought. Yeah, right. right. So make sure you don't want to have. It's when you reply all, you get in trouble. Yeah. Exactly. You have to share or something <laughs> like that because it becomes, even if it's sequential, you don't all respond to each other. It counts as deliberation. Yeah. So, if it's not just about housekeeping, like, you know, when's the, when is the meeting if it's not in July 4th? Yeah, answer the question. The, 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 count, the board cannot have work groups. The, get together and sit down and throw things around. Right. If, well, without that being a meeting, you, you yeah. can, but you can't have a quorum. Right, right, right. How about right. Four? Three. It's three. Quorum is three. Yeah, we've never done that, but I think you would have to have, um, yeah. Less well, I was just thinking of like, the, the, but, uh, right. what Dara said about the examples. You know, we'd be nice right. to sit down right. and put together examples, but we think the things we'd like Allison to work on and just yeah. discuss that and say, okay, we want this, 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 and this, and this. And, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. We haven't so ever, good. in my tenure, we haven't ever done that, had a sub working group. Okay. So. We do that a lot in the co-op board. I'm on. Do this, so that's good. Yeah.
but the co-op board isn't subject to open meeting laws, so that's where it gets uh, you know complicated. Good reason. Um, okay, so uh, if there's nothing else, I mean we have no time left here, but if there's nothing else, we can. Okay. Um, can we continue the meeting without Allison to do our examples to center, or do we have to? If we let Allison go, we have to end. Oh no, no, no. We're you know, no, no. This so speaking, we can we can we can do that. Okay, yeah, of course. But we can also do it with for here, unless you have to go, Allison. So. No. Okay. Do we need to motion to continue this? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't I don't think so. I did I just think a reference to that in the notes. It's just um, a discussion. Yeah, because at this point we're just in discussion. We're not in a deliberation, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, any other thoughts while Allison is with us? Questions or comments? It's been very helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It was. It was nice to meet you all, and looking Thank forward to continuing working on this. So we will be in touch about figuring out when the next meeting is. Great. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm around all of July. So, uh, all right. Cool. <laughs> all right. Talk to you all later. All Bye. right. Take care. Bye. Right. So, we're still on this item. Is this further discussion or? Well, we want examples. Well, uh, Steve had examples of, you know, size lot, you know, the one acre, I mean, five acre, 10 acre, how much is missing. Maybe we can you know, put those together. If we say the 10 acre property, 30% of it is already a slope of over 24%. You know, but do we want, that's what we want to do, right? Is give her those sorts of things. I think we tasked her with doing that for us. Right. But then we want to give her this specific example. We're just going to rely on her example. Okay, that's fine. I thought we were going to. I think she, get, she understood. I mean, she has okay. a grant. I don't know how many hours she has available. They always. Okay. I, I think she'll. We could make suggestions for the parameters that we wanted to test. That's how I meant. You know, so the size, the size of the lot and how much, are, you know, if it's uh, just so we get a feel. For what I'd like is. to see a variety of lot sizes to see kind of, mm -hmm. you know, what does this look like on a hundred acre parcel versus 20 acres? Yeah. I agree. You know, within the bounds of what's actually what exists. Right. Mm -hmm. Because like, if you look at that map, the, the what is it, pink or purple sections there? The light purple. They are not used. decent parcels in the... So that might be something good to capture in the notes if we want to ask for various sizes, lot sizes uh, in the examples. She might already be assuming that, but um, yeah, I mean, she didn't seem to be saying, oh, I only have so many hours available. So it's very available. For, uh, but knowing the September deadline, it's good to. I mean, I would say the upper bound should be the largest lot that exists that's right, right unless there's it's realistic to assume that these could be uh combined fine, fine. right right i wondered about that too and hard <laughs> we may have one owner who owns four or five of those all together these, right. uh, tax yeah. maps is one lot so right it, it could be her judgment as to what the largest reasonable assemblage yeah. could be yeah her current, current circumstances yeah no, that would be good Yeah, because examples are just so helpful to right. picture something. So, and and I, you know, I I like the fact of you know we're using other uh, communities, you know, experience and as a guide, but we're not beholden to it. So the idea of just you know counting the slope, well, we're, well that is open space. <laughs> you know, just because you can't put something on it. And, but, you know, normally so. when these are done, you you're supposed to be comparing it against what you. There was some other thing that was struck that would have made this make made that more, more sense. So I've seen developments where you just have to demonstrate that you could develop it under normal circumstances so that you can be allowed to do the, the special way. If it's undevelopable altogether, then you can't do anything. I don't know, it's just a, I think it's an artifact from other types of maneuvers people try to do. But I'm just thinking only about what we're trying to accomplish here with the preservation district. It doesn't make any sense.
kind of as a way of constraining the density, mm -hmm. which is often mm -hmm. desired, but that's not the case here, I think. Okay. So I have questions that are not involved with this, just on board in general and understanding its functions. This is an okay place to ask. So sort of well, why don't we um, wrap up this item? We do have, um, at the end of the meeting, we always have board and staff reports, and that's sometimes been uh, an opportunity to bring up more general okay. processes and stuff like that. Um, is there any anything more on this item, or should we move on to um, our action items? Okay. I don't have anything. Okay. So we, we're obviously not doing the deliberation uh, or initiation on this. So next is the issue of um, uh, endorsement of the uh, Move forward with identifying farmland of local importance in Greenfield by the American Farmland Trust. So um, this was, you know, brought up at the last um, board meeting. I did subsequently have a conversation with Sarah Gardner, who had uh, approached me as uh, planning board chair. Um, and uh, the main uh, questions I had that wasn't absolutely clear to me from the materials provided were, is there any um cost to the city and the answer was no my next one was is there any reason to go on to the parcels to do this soil analysis because i don't know how this stuff works and she also said no this is you know based on uh existing uh soil analysis that, that they have and then lastly was there any reason to have any contact with property owners about this and she said no so it seemed like a very soft touch and the benefit is uh, that potentially could um, increase the chance to meet eligibility requirements for something like an APR. Um, so uh, it seemed to me uh, in the vernacular, I wrote to Eric and said, seems like a no-brainer. And Eric said, yeah, it seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> so, but I want to, um, it's something that according to, you know, what I um, uh, talked with her and, and she'd written about, it's, it's a pretty informal process that I can just, as, as chair, just say, yes, go ahead with this. Um, and I did um, inform uh, the mayor of this just to have total you know, transparency and didn't hear back. And if I asked if she had any questions or concerns, didn't hear back. So, um, so any, any um, thoughts about this or is the... Uh... Again, I'm, I, I... I don't understand the real purposes behind these. Everything just seems to be to take potential land off our roads. So there's another tool that could be used to say, take, let's say all the land out of the lot in on Plain Road and Corian Road, all that farmland that's up there. Uh, just taking that off the rolls for any future use other than farming is what it sounds like That's this is all about. I guess it's up to the individual. Okay, so that's up to the Unitas's and the Patinsky's, and if they want to do that, that's fine. But I don't know, uh, is this asking us to endorse them to do that? No. What, it, is, what is this all about? Right. This would be to, there are certain categories of farmland that um, would count toward some kind of protection if a property owner wanted to pursue it. This would supplement those categories it's an additional aspect of the soil analysis so if something wasn't quite at the um percentage needed to qualify for example for an apr this might this additional information data might allow it to be if a property owner wants to pursue that so so it's just i think it's opening up possibilities it's not mandating anything no, I, so, yeah they're asking us to endorse this plan, I would think, what's that why it's before the board? Right, so I had, because, you know, the indication was I could individually as planning board chair, um, you say, yeah, go ahead and do this. And my preference is, you know, since I'm representing the board is to, you know, to serve the board by bringing this and making sure I would be representing the board's will and the board's wish. So it does seem to me like something that's a positive thing and, uh, which could, um, you know, create a possibility, uh, but not be intrusive and not not require anything. So um, that's why I wanted to just ask if uh, 
the board was supportive of that. And if so, I will contact. I'm Sarah. supportive of, of spaces that are being used for what they're being used in the preserve spaces for that need if need be. But I'm also for letting the town grow if it wants to grow. I guess my biggest concern is, are we are we again limiting ourselves and our opportunities in the future for growth in this community by by having this? That's my only concern. And then, you know, I, I'm actually the benefit of one of these because the property behind me is is an APR that's the state owned and it's going to be farmland forever, and that's great. You know, I don't have to worry about a development behind me. Mm -hmm. I'm against development, but there's not going to be one. So I I have mixed feelings on it. I just want to make sure that we're not shooting ourselves in the foot mm -hmm. by doing things like this. On it. Yes. And, and and I will, you know, speaking to the master plan, this encouragement in the master plan to to look into APR yeah. possibilities. So mm -hmm. other other voices, other thoughts? Well, I took a look at the map of um area towns and cities that have um identified farmland of local importance and it includes the vast majority of towns in our county yeah, um, like the one out. so um that's a kind of an indicator of to me but i don't um, i don't think we'll find that sorry um and then i mean it doesn't really seem to have any impact on land use. It's just identifying farmland that might not have been identified by a previous soil survey. It's all very geological. It seemed like it would include more like, for example, orchard space, um, like land that would be used for farm agricultural reasons, but not necessarily like um traditional rich soil mm -hmm. um that was just my interpretation i'm not sure if anyone else had a different understanding just like reading through the, mm -hmm. the presentation materials that we got is there a map of greenfield to show what the impact would be here that would be what the analysis would be oh it would figure that out okay right that would be giving approval for them to do that analysis. To do the analysis, but not also have it be designated by default. How, how do you mean designated? If we say they can do the analysis, we're not endorsing the designation of certain lands as of local importance, we're just authorizing them to conduct the analysis. Right, their term is um, farmland of local importance, and that's just based on the soil analysis and so it would be an additional, my understanding was an additional aspect of the analysis of the soils. And um, it might, in some circumstances, it's not known for sure, it might increase the percentage. So it might make something qualify for potential protection. But if nothing is mandated about doing anything about it, it's just. What? But someone would have to ask for that protection. So let's again use the Batinskis. Let's say they find 60 acres behind the Batinskis. That's possible farmland. They'd have to approach the Batinskis and they have to say, yes, I want you to designate that. That I would work. You, you mean about an APR or something like that? They do the soil analysis and the yeah. soil analysis comes back and you can tell, you know, one of them, hey, look, you got 60 acres back here. That could be farmland. If you want to do an APR, you can do it if you want to. They would then approach them and they would look for them to do who, who would approach so them? So someone would approach them and say, you've got this potential land that could be an APR. How does it? My understanding at this point is if we give the go ahead, they're just giving us the analysis, right. providing us from the data. And there's no further, they're not approaching any property owners and there's no determination of how that information is used. Oh, okay. It's just, we're just getting the information. Why are they asking us for permission to do that? Uh, well, it's USDA. Yeah, they just, I, I would think they could just do it. Didn't they already do it? Like, is there anything to do? You just, is they already, already got the information, just haven't asked for it. And just, really, as, as I read it, it seems like they're just trying to create overlay maps for like, like a GIS overlay mm -hmm. that would have areas of significance, not necessarily restriction or. Unless I'm totally off base here, but but it seems clear that their their 
protocol is to check with the community rather than presume uh, to do it. So they want to have the actual designation assigned. That's my assumption. That they, their intent is to have it designated as farmland and as off the it's done. It's undeveloped. I, I think other farm. That's my understanding. They, they want us to their intent. be into this process so we might find some land in our town and, and designate it. We want, they want us to be excited about it. Because they maybe already did it and they can pretend to do it again and then show us the map and say, hey, look at this spot. And we can, but we would decide on a case by case basis if we think that something. That maybe we find a parcel in the center of town that's prime farm. Yeah, maybe my front yard is actually. <laughs> uh, be, I'll sell you my property. <laughs> so it says in the cover email, uh, we would draw up a document listing all the locally important farmland soils in the town and. Uh, town official or board chair signs off on the document. And so basically, we, 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 the information. We'd have, to, we, we'd have a chance to look at the information. Mm -hmm. okay. Modify or something. I guess I'm, I'm also concerned that this could somehow endanger developable land that isn't actually ever going to be a farm, but like suddenly it gets on people's radar and now people want to make it a farm and we lose a chance to have more housing somewhere. But, no, my fault. Yeah. On the other hand, farms are good too. So yeah, it seems, it seems like taking the first step is not harmful. And we, but we can't. Know, we can't what the what their results are. I wouldn't just want to sign it without examining it. I mean, the majority of Greenfield's growth has been in the northwest corner of the city, anyways. That's the only area that's seen significant growth in the last twenty five years. Yeah, which is interesting because it's also where most of the farmland of the city is. Yeah. So. It's like little pockets of development. That's around. how it goes. Once a farmer's yeah. family is, they've sold off that land and then that's the retirement plan. All right. Okay. So, so we, so if, um, if someone wants to make a motion, could make a motion to endorse moving forward with this process. As long as it doesn't commit us to, you know, putting anything on anybody's role, it's just data, data information being provided for us to review. I'm fine. I'm fine with it. That's my understanding of what's. I am. I'm in the same boat. I'll make a motion to allow them to proceed. I'll second. It, it says it endorse moving forward with the okay. process. So endorse yeah. uh, motion to endorse moving forward with the. Right. And with yeah. second, second. Right. And uh, any further discussion? They're not. Do they. Oh, I guess we can just ask them when they're going to be done and get a time. So, so how do you are you interfacing with them? You tell them yes, good to go. I would I would let them know. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, and get a timeline. And, yeah, okay. when we should expect to see it. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And I can ask too for reassurance um, that there aren't any hidden yeah. <laughs> implications of this. If they could get it to us. <laughs> before our, the next, that well, whatever the meeting would be yeah, here, right yeah. but it's time to see it it does yeah. say here in their document no regulatory association with the designation so. yeah. all right any further discussion of it all in favor uh you know thank you all right now we have a few anrs um first one is the it's uh, one, two, four, five, Burnison. Any questions or comments? I did discuss these with Eric, just because sometimes these are curious. Any thoughts or questions about this one? Just adding a driveway to the northern end of their property well no it's it's sectioning off um this where the dash line is yes where the dash line is lot shape yep uh, it's it's quite unusual so that's the portion that has the proposed driveway in it. um and then this is being sectioned off from that and this section right here is continuing to stay with this person and if you look at this little, and Eric hadn't noticed this, um, the box there, it says um, five feet off and parallel to the existing property line. Get a little. This is a five foot strip. To get to it. That connects 
this section with this section right here. It's and Eric said that's odd. I've never seen that, but it wouldn't affect it qualifying for the ANR endorsement. So, so this was reviewed by the planning department and it qualified. Yes, Eric is recommending that. The, well, the extent of our <laughs> dedicating that we need to do this, much. even with me no. pointing out that this is our five foot strip. It is um, strange. Yeah. Um, and this is related to the solar project that, um, that we were involved with um, uh, a number of years ago. But it it uh, straddles um, Greenfield and Berniston. We had quite a, quite a uh, field trip. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Pretty rugged uh, terrain. Um, so it's, it's related in some portion of property that's adjacent to that. So, and if you see the the property owner, um, Capel, I guess it's pronounced, even you know further below, there's additional. So that person owns quite a bit of property up that way. It seemed like they wanted to. If they didn't have that little five foot thing, then the that little fragment of parcel could be orphaned out there. That's what. It, yeah, that's a, it's relative to the part. The rest of the parcel is being carved off of. Yeah, unusual, but um, that's the protected parcel. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Pack it away there in the back where it's filled with useless. So, looking for a motion to uh, endorse again. This is not approving because it's approval not required, but it's endorsing this uh, A and R plan. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Uh, unanimous. And then there's the. Uh, suggested as is on the, um, uh, the uh, minutes taking form to to just have an additional vote for the chair to sign on behalf of the board. Because otherwise, I all can, the board members have that. I can make that motion. Please, I would um, move that George be authorized to sign the ANR plan for twelve forty five Bernstein Road, submitted by. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, uh, and all in favor? Aye. Was that unanimous? Yes. Okay. Uh, next, we have which one is this? This is um, Davis Street. Yep, three sixty eight Davis Street, and this is uh, I was a little confused at first because whereas on the first, previous one it was a dotted line that designated, mm -hmm. this is the solid line that designates. So it's this. Line going from here, this. So this had all been one lot, and this would make it two lots, lot one and two, and that would be the dividing line here. But it still has this, the necessary frontage, et cetera. So uh, any questions or comments about that? Or is there a motion to endorse? What is the structure? Is that an existing? Yep, these are existing structures. There's apparently both the house, but there's also an apartment that's you know part of that garage. So I know there's another garage on that property. It's kind of weird, but these are all existing structures. He's just yeah. dividing a lot. Yep. Motion to endorse, or still moved. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor. All right. Motion for me to sign? Yes, I moved. Second. Assume no discussion. All in favor? All right. Very good. Third one. Uh, and this is. Uh, Rainbow? Yeah, this is off the uh, Myers uh, farm lane. Yeah. Myers farm. Uh, so that is um, separating out the. Um, rest of that parcel yes the middle the section between the school and the established uh development there um and eric said there that hasn't been developed and they plan to sell that interesting them a and ring it isn't dependent on us knowing or approving what we'll be telling it's just it's just that it meets the the limited guidelines right so uh but it's always interesting if if it's known um PCC has a 10 foot wide strip of land. What is that again? Along the. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty more common than I thought. It's yeah. <laughs> popular. Five feet, 10 feet. Yeah. Um, so, is there a motion to endorse? I moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? 
Well, for me to sign. Second. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Very good. Um, thanks, everybody. So now we get on to board and staff uh, reports. I can just say I, I uh, unfortunately was not feeling well the last uh, uh, sustainable being drilled mass, the master plan and implementation committee meeting, and I haven't watched the video yet, so I don't. But the uh, primary focus has continued to be on those um, draft uh, chapters for the master plan um, that we had talked about. So um, continue to go through those and make tweets on that, but I'm sorry, I can't report specifically. And um, Amy's on the community preservation committee and but it's not here. So. Um, so you had Victor some kind of general just, questions. Just, just general questions to understanding yeah. how the what the board's all about, how it works. Sure. Um, these A and R's that keep popping up in front of us. Yes. That is that someone has wanted is wanting to build something on a lot and they're allowed to build it anyway. It, and we're just looking at it and saying we don't care. It's actually simpler than that. Okay. They're just they're either dividing an existing lot or they're combining lots. And so um, this is a very unusual, uh, Erica said it's unique to Massachusetts. Um, and it's something he's, he doesn't think is the greatest development approach, uh, but uh, it, there's a, and there's a whole section in the, a large section on this and it's mostly okay. case law and stuff like that. Um, so. so the board, let's say the board does not endorse what does that mean? So the the board is required to endorse it if it meets what are the two criteria? The frontage and what's the second one? Means of access. Access and, and compliance with local zoning according to so it's, yeah. but it's but it's just for subdivide, it's not for actually building anything, anything being right. so strictly right. subdividing a lot of things. Yes, it's just it's but just that's, or combining sometimes lot. That happens too. And um right, it's uh, sometimes like I say. We happen to know what the purpose is or it was shared, but we, we don't need to know that to do it. But I'll tell you, there's, there's um, two things. One is that um, there had been uh, a habit with uh, previous um, uh, years in the board where the chair did this autonomously, just did it, you know, it didn't come before the whole board. I mean, because obviously mostly we're just like, well, you know, okay, yes, we wrote twice and um, uh, nothing more to do. Uh, but it does give a feel for things in the community. Plus, it's required by law that the whole board do it. Yeah, sure. um, so I had gone to one one of the trainings, uh, and I happened to mention that was how it worked. And I said, what? You can't do that. So, okay. So I brought it back to the board, and it was changed. But um, uh, the, um, oh, um, well, the other thing is that occasionally we might question something or find something that uh, – uh, raises a concern about whether we can endorse it. It's rare, but there was one where uh, Charles, uh, the former chair, um, noticed that when you have an opening to a lot, it has to uh, have a certain um, uh, width, uh, minimum width going through to the developable area. And so you can basically picture there's a sphere and it's a, or a circle and it's going through. And there was one that I came across and he, he caught that you couldn't do that. It was too narrow an entrance and stuff like that. So we didn't endorse that. It was brought back to the to the propo uh, person proposing it, and they altered the plan. So um, sure. we're occasionally looking for things like that that might. And Eric Ed, Eric hadn't got that, and he appreciated that. So I hearken back to that sometimes. And, you know, our own vigilance. So, yeah. So uh, another question: When some somebody wants to develop or build something in town, how is that reviewed? For example. Uh, the Aldis. Does that come yep. for the planning board first? And the planning board says yes or no to an Aldis, or does it sure. fall if a lot is zoned for commercial and it, yep. their thing fits all of it? We never see it and never have any comments on it. Because I'm, I'm trying to understand our role. I, sure. I envision the planning board as, again, not directing in the sense we're telling you what to do, but kind of modifying, you know, keeping a, keeping a feel or a look and saying, Hmm, do we really want five more grocery stores in Greenfield? We don't really want that. We don't. We don't want that. Who who has any say in that, sure. or is there such a board that has a say in that? And 
So doesn't work. Sure. So if something, a proposal brought forward, it, it, the question really is, what is the zoning for that area? And is that allowed by right? By right. Or is it a require a special permit? Um, and so that would uh, mean that if it requires a special permit, um, then it's even a higher level of scrutiny and discretion on the part of the, uh, the special permit granting authority, SPGA, and that might be us and it might be the ZBA. Yeah. <clears throat> so if it's a um, site plan review, we are much more limited in the um, kind of conditions we can impose um, because it's basically a lot by right. Um, so, uh, and then there's an additional level, which is the major development review, which is a site plan review and a special permit, but it's a higher level. And that was the thing that had come, we discussed. Discuss about change. About, you know, retweaking some of those things yeah. potentially, you know, reviewing that uh, in a more uh, systematic way, because that's one additional level. Now, those things don't address, do, you know, the use itself. Like, do we, do we need another grocery store? That's not really the issue. Unless, I mean, under the um, major development review, there's a lot more scrutiny about, like, economic factors, the impact and stuff like that. But um, a lot of times we're not, or generally we're not saying we got so many of those, so we don't need it. That's, that's generally not. In my short term on the ZBA, I remember I had a meeting with uh, Mr. Singer about it. Um, his, he said the function of that particular was to protect the community, protect the I think it's that word, the nature of the community or the mm -hmm. existing conditions of the community. So in other words, if you had a residential area and someone wanted to put a, a baseball stadium in the middle of it, you know, you could say, well, I don't know, does that protect the community or does that adversely affect the community? Mm -hmm. And that was his tone. Yeah. And that was because we couldn't we couldn't be capricious. So I didn't quite understand that. But so it's really more of a ZBA decision to say, okay, this is this is going to adversely affect the tone and nature of the community. So we do not. But it's already got it's already gotten approval though. That when it goes to the DBA, from what I remember, it's already been passed by the planning board. It's just looking for us or the, the local board just needs a special permit right. to build it. Well the ZBA does a lot of things like variances, like you know, yep. signage and uh -huh. uh, you know stuff like that. Um uh, but also they do some special permits. Um, and, you know, it, a lot of it, I think, is it's about the zoning ordinance itself right. and how proactive you are. So that, for example, when that dramatic change to the major development review was done, that reduced our capacity, you know, as a town to have a say over larger developments because a lot of them, some of them that might have, like the Aldi's or the, right. uh, what was the one that just, uh, Starbucks. Starbucks, would have come on, previously come under major development review. Doesn't mean they're rejected, because as Eric pointed out, just look none of them it. had been rejected. Yeah, get to just, look at it. Yeah, more and more influence on, right. on it. Right. So, yeah, so it's really, and that's what I, you know, I've experienced and I've, you know, trying to you know educate members of the public it's a lot of it's, it's boring and it's you know nerdy kind of stuff you know what's in the zoning ordinance like we're talking about with you know the cluster development right, right. you know it's it's this incremental stuff of reviewing this and setting the table for what can come in or how, what kind of scrutiny will it get so they really to go you know keep set up on the last meeting we really need more of our building codes and our zoning codes and how we want things to look and feel like let's do signage. We want all the signage on Main Street to have a particular look and feel. That would be zoning, right? So the zoning law would have to be adjusted for that. Or yep. We want all, signage all the facades to fit the 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 area of the buildings. You couldn't build a modern building in the middle of red brick buildings. That's a zoning thing. We wouldn't have any say so in that. There's no board that would say, no, sorry, you can't put a Wilson's facade up. We can give ourselves power. We don't happen to have a whole lot, right? But like we had talked before about not only changing thresholds for site plan review, but changing the conditions of site plan review. So it's more than just traffic, for example. All right. 
I think we'd have to get support from the council and or somebody else for that. I don't know where that gets or is no, it's the council. We we only recommend. We can't decide to change anything in here. We recommend as the council has the power, the authority to change the zoning ordinance. So that's why Well, we could put it forward to the council. Oh, exactly. That's what we're talking about with this yeah, thing okay. we talked about tonight. All right. And and it, and how crucial it is, we've learned about, you know, providing sufficient education because it is it is stuff that's hard to it's complicated and it's hard to and if you don't know and you're being asked to change something fundamentally, you're probably going to err on the side of caution and say, well, I don't want to change it if I don't really get what I'm voting for. You know, it's kind of like you were saying about the fuck plan. Ah, are we sure? <laughs> so what are the ramifications? Right. You know? So, but that's, yeah, it's, it's really that process of um, trying to um, scrutinize what these uh, signage, for example. We did a review of the signage in last, last year or the year before. Uh, brought forward changes. And, you know, one example was about the issue of the um, uh, well, dynamic display right. and trying to restrict that just because of how it would look, right. you know, to have all these signs flashing, flashing the place yeah. and um, concerned about, you know, traffic safety, that kind of thing. But also there was a previously, if a um, uh, building were on a corner lot, you could only have a sign on one side. And we proposed... You could have it on both sides. And that was uh, something we recommended, and I believe this, uh, the council approved. So I don't know if we have a if we set our own agenda on something, but I, I, yeah. I'd, like, I'd like to have a discussion on that uh, major development plan as far as that's concerned mm -hmm. and things we've been talking about, maybe putting something forward to the town that gives us yeah. a little bit more input. Yep. I mean, no, that's, that's um, as was in the minutes, that was one of the things we talked about. And so it's kind of on the kind of on our planning agenda, okay. you know, to going forward. So hmm? to do list. To do list. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Is it have it when is when do we do it? Oh we we you know um we can decide. Yeah we can decide. <laughs> I mean obviously the the um the this thing we're we're talking about tonight is time sensitive so yeah. we want to deal with that. Yeah. And um we don't know when the um I mean we, we could decide whether we want to prioritize the additional two chapters, for example, or studying the MDR. So, um, so if people know right now, or, you know, I mean, well, I'm going to discuss it next at the next meeting when Eric's here and we can, you know, cause we want to figure out, cause he'll know what's coming through the pipeline as well. And we have to balance out, uh, cause it is, you know, nice to, um, it, it is that dual role we have of long-term planning, you know, but also dealing with some, some that's brought right to us. And he, he knows what's in the pipeline. Right. And the other thing that happens um, is, I mean, some, some towns, some of these smaller towns, there's no professional staff. I can't imagine it, <laughs> you know, to, to, you know, screen things and stuff like that. But, um, you know, we have the, oh, what's it called when they do the, um, they have their, uh, a group of you know the the you know DPW and Erica's planning and other oh I'm, I'm blanking on the official name of it but there's a group that gets together to review projects and so that's when we get those reports you know Eric you know give detailed thing and others just say no issues with this project or something like that so we get the benefit of all that expertise as well so so we're fortunate in that way I think because we have this you know the staff you know support for the process. George, do yes. you know if any members, current members of the city council were previously on the planning board? Or is that or is that number zero? I have to study it. I don't know offhand. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Just curious, just for context. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah. Offhand, I'm inclined to say zero. Yeah. I can't think of no one jumps out at me. Any other general discussion points or moving to wrapping up? Do we have, I'd be curious, it is a quest for Eric, I think. BRCOG is, one of their roles is to provide technical assistance to mm -hmm. communities. I mean, we have a planning staff, others don't, so they serve that role. But uh, can we use them more to do some of these studies for us? And, and my understanding is the there are certain you know, Grant, like she was saying, this is a time limit kind of thing. So I don't know exactly how that works, but that would be a great question for Eric for next yeah. week. We could do next month for us. But I think it feels 
Thank you. you. Got a resource, use it. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of the, her or the other people in their staff, the, there's, they're a third party advisor yeah. that they have standing with the, the region. We said we wouldn't be perceived as just going rogue, you know, coming up with our own ideas. <laughs> well, I, I know it's been great when they are available to do that. I just don't, it usually seems it's tied to some availability based on something, but I, I Eric could ask. It's only between January and June, probably. It's, it's the grant cycles, you know. Oh, I, I, I don't know if it's always grant, but okay. there's, yeah. So they'll be asking Eric would be good. Yeah. Just, yeah. Cause she was great for this. I think she'll be really helpful to just, Mm -hmm. help the educational piece just to help kind of facilitate the, the dialogue so one last general question did, I, did anyone attend the, the housing meeting can you i did an overview of what it was like but what, 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 what i think jeff was there yeah i, I was it, i'm the consultant okay. <laughs> so i don't know if you actually presented it or not but did, yeah so was that recorded i can't remember i watched it live but i think so is yeah. it recorded? I don't know. It, yes, I believe it was. What was it just the just the curiosity? As a citizen who also observed it. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'm not gonna make any arguments for or against what was said. No, no, just the, the the scope is to conduct a housing needs assessment, which is just a a study of the existing housing stock and the existing residents and what housing needs they have and compare the two and just see where there's misalignments or, or shortages, and also get a feel for what future housing policy, housing development policy should be to advance the community's goals for, for housing. So typically it's, you know, a lot of times it's zoning changes or making better use of financing opportunities for affordable housing. There's a number of things that we'll get to later. This presentation was just to kind of share the data okay. and get people up to speed with the state, the, the landscape and the state of the situation. We say we record it, so I go into Greenfield site, I should be able to find it. Yeah, and I'd imagine the presentation is also online, just the document. And there were a good number of people there. It, I would say a range of opinions, but yeah, sorry. it wasn't a balanced range. There were a few people that had pretty specific uh, opinions and other people were a little more generally broad, open or listening. It is, I can, I can, Greenfield is a, have you heard the term NIMBY? Not in my backyard? Yeah. No. Greenfield is a YIMBY community. What's that mean? Yes, in my backyard. Awesome. Okay. You can get a feel when you're in a room, just mm -hmm. are they, or you not not for you or against you. I'm not going to convince anybody right. or anything. Right. Just, mm -hmm. just information right now. But the types of questions people ask mm -hmm. gives you a sense of where their priorities are. Do they want to see more or less housing, more or less restriction? And you know, there's always a reasonable basis for at least a lot of the, the positions. But you know, do we deal with ADUs in the planning board? Accessory dwelling. Yeah. Yes. That's a big hot button thing right now. Do you know what that is? That's someone else's house, like a mother daughter type thing. Right? Yeah, you, an extra yeah. unit in your backyard yeah. or around your yeah. house or whatever. Right. And that was one and that went from planning board to by right to special permit, or do it's, I have that wrong? It, no, it, it, it no, it, it's bounced around. It's a bit. changed. I can't, I can't remember who who's the special permit granting authority now because it was switched to the ZBI. I can't remember. I thought it was switched back to us, but I'm not sure. But um, the, it had changed as far as. Um, currently, uh, the uh, uh, internal one and the attached are by right, and the detached is special permit. Yeah. And that's something that um, the first time that was proposed, it failed uh, at the council. And then we proposed it again, and it passed. So that was so a detached ADU would go to. ZBA? I, I can't remember. Who said. Oh, I, remember. I remember because when oh. I was thinking about joining the planning board, this was um, in the meeting minutes. Okay. And the board approved a special permit for an ADU. Um, I remember because there was an issue with the number of planning board members at that meeting. Oh, God, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Last, yes, yes, last yes. August? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, the mayor's so, cat, uh, status as far as yeah, I yeah. remember uh, it did come before the planning board. Yeah, that's right. So it is back with the planning board. It had been yeah. switched, and that was yeah. So at one point, was thank you. 
So, um, yeah, so that is an example of where, and I don't know if it was lack of information or just, you know, opinion that, that, that you know, the, the council at that time was wary of it. And it's, it's been something that, you know, people have been, had mixed feelings about. So, you know. One of those issues that brings out deeper. <laughs> well, that was something at that, at that meeting, there was a big debate back and forth about the uh, ownership requirement. Yeah. Of our ADU ordinance that so you have to, the owner has to be in living in one of the right. units. It could be in the smaller one, but the owner has to be in one of them. And it was being suggested vigorously by someone to drop that. It was a real regressive and it was vigorously yeah. <laughs> uh, it was proposed debate. to keep it by, yeah, it was a little bit of a debate. It took a good amount of air in the room. <laughs> sure. Oh. It's, it's a fun thing to, to argue about. It? <laughs> and, um, we're working in Hawaii right now, actually going there next week. And they just approved by right two ADUs per parcel. Wow. Wow. Because they just have such a profound shortage of housing there. Uh, wow. So I sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I had a question about the, the housing study process. Uh, was that meeting like to get feedback or was it to just like give people an idea of what the data is on housing or as a member of the public course. Yeah. Uh, it, it's oh. Because I was there. <laughs> not representing uh, okay. I can speak Maybe that's a sticky line just, of just, inquiry. I, just, I think I can answer that question. Just as, as it sure. actually it's the it was both. It was to yeah. to share information and then get it wasn't a public, it's not a, the type of meeting that has like official public hearings or anything, mm. uh, but it is just a chance to share the information and get reaction. Yeah, reaction mm -hmm. comments. But the, the, I think the city's interested in gauging where people's priorities are. Mm -hmm. And a great way to do that is just to yeah. uh, throw the data at them and see what, mm -hmm. uh, how they feel about it. See what comes back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've, I haven't been here that long, 2019, but I've heard of, of potential developments that the, the town didn't want to do. Like I understood that the charter school over on Coleraine was originally uh, interested by IBM. IBM was interested in building an office building there and the town said no. And there had been, um, yes, there had been a proposal. This is around the time when I moved to town in 2002 or so. It was around that time about having, yes, some kind of a um, office. Uh, the Myers uh, farm. Line. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They yeah. ultimately built condos there so who says no to things like that that, that that's another one of my questions where i can't remember the process about that either yeah. and i also heard that the, the cinema was approached by a, a play company and they were going to build a playhouse in there and who was uh, the, i don't remember the name but someone approached the town about buying the cinema to turn it in, back into a playhouse because of the stage in it and everything else in the town didn't want that either i'm wondering if you're thinking of the bank because no, the town didn't own the cinema. I, I, the town, the bank on Bank Road. No, I heard it was the cinema. I'm just curious oh. as to, again, going back to the question of who says no? Who told yeah, yeah. IBM, we don't it, want you? Yeah, it depends. I, and, and sometimes things have gone before public vote. Um, so, public. yeah, some, some things have. So, um, so, I mean, famously, in 93, the issue about rezoning for uh, uh, Walmart. Walmart. Yeah, I heard about yeah. That. and that that was ended up going before a, a binding um, uh, vote of the city. It went back and forth a bit, I guess, before my time, but and it ended up uh, being close vote, but um, it right. was defeated to make the zoning change, and um, that made national news. So, yeah, really? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I know yeah. That. Oh, that's yeah. Nice. Do we have any uh, input on on properties that are vacant and trying to get use of them? Like the, I think it was an old. Western Electric or something by High Big Y, the building right behind yeah. Big Y, Mass Electric, I think. Well, certainly um, handling that, yeah. trying to get that. This would be a better question for Eric. What the Eric, process? I, I mean, we've certainly from um, infill has been something that we've talked about prioritizing, and I'd like to hear Eric's uh, input about where things stand with that. Cause that's something we've discussed on the board and I can't remember exactly. I thought that was business development job to, to be working on that. Well, that's, that's the question of, you know, doing it, again, it's a matter of what is the zoning and how could the zoning facilitate a proposal right. rather than, or block it. Right. And uh, then the other is, um, 
you know, who would be then seeking someone to, you know, right. so the economic development person in town might be recruiting people, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. seeking yeah. people, but it, it would depend on what's allowable. Right. So okay. the good question. Yeah. But I'll, I'll make it. Ownership too. Yeah. Like I think if there was a city owned vacant lot. Right. Right. We might make a suggestion about what's to be done. But if someone else owns it, you know, we, we can't. Well, I even suggest just by, you know, trying to move it along. So I guess someone's still collecting taxes on it. So it doesn't really matter to us. But it'd be nice if you could put 20 people to work, too. You know, and have something in there that would put people to work while we're collecting taxes. So that, that's what I Who's trying to move it? Is anyone right. in the town trying to move it? Does anyone really care in the town? You know, that's my problem. Community. Economic Development Department does some of that, then right. Mayor does. I think there's all sorts of champions for all sorts of things. But no, but it's good. Th things can still fall off the radar, though. It's good. But it's good to know what is our role within that, and a lot of it is of what is the zoning and what does the zoning allow, rather than you know block something. So, thank you. Sure. I apologize for calling you Steve, Jeff. Oh, I don't know okay. why I was thinking that, Steve. <laughs> 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 so our next regular meeting would be I this is what Eric was pointing out was that the first Thursday would be July 4th yes so mm -hmm. this is something we can communicate with the email because this is considered housekeeping okay. is when will our next meeting be so I'll check with Eric about what it is are you all free on July 4th no I'm just um, yes. <laughs> I, would, I would be free on the following Thursday yeah. okay. which would so, make the most sense I think yeah. right that would be the 11th. I will be camping, but I will join you virtually. Seriously. Oh, really? That's dedication. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll broach that to Eric, see if you can do it. I think I can. July 11th. All right. Cool. And with that, um, motion yes. to adjourn. So moved. Yeah. Uh, I assume there's no discussion. All in favor? All right.